how many servants does the King of England have? If you think the number is over 2,000, raise your hand. Over 2,000. If you think it's under 2,000, raise your hand. If you're afraid I'm going to call on you and make you explain your answer, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you think he has no servants at all? You're wrong. The King of England has no servants whatsoever. Truth of the matter is, really not a king. He's just sort of a picture of a king. I think they used to have a king. We might have broke them of that habit. I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the King of England doesn't really function as a king anymore, sort of a figurehead and all that. And, uh, and he has no servants. Uh, but we are servants of the king. You and I, that's right. We are servants of the king. You know, during the last days of his life, Jesus, our king, spoke um, more and more about ultimate things, uh, about the big things. He spoke about his death. He spoke about his resurrection. He spoke about his departure. He spoke about, spoke about his return. At the close of Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel in chapter 25, Jesus, in keeping with this, talking about the ultimate things, tells three parables. The first one's the parable of the virgins. Remember the, 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 some of them were wise, some of them were foolish, and the ones that were foolish did not get to go in uh, and be with the bridegroom. And we're going to look at the second one today. It's Matthew 25, uh, beginning at the, the uh, 14th verse. And this, this is our king uh, speaking to us, and it goes like this. Again, it, that's the kingdom of heaven, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold uh, gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I haven't sown? Gather where I've not scattered seed? Well, then you, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has, has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, that's something else, isn't it? There are two periods of time mentioned in this, in this parable. Um, there's present day, that's, that's the time of responsibility. Responsibility, that's the first one. It's now. This, this is the era of responsibility. We're to use what God has given us uh, for his mission and we're to do it right now. The master in the parable gives them each goal. Five, uh, two, one, the three servants, right? Each one actually was a huge amount of money. Uh, and the, Jesus tells the parable this way. It's exaggerated. These bags of gold, right? Um, it's huge. And he does this so the reader will know this isn't just about money. This, this is something. It includes money, of course. I mean, you know, it's something God has given us. 
that we're responsible for, but it's not just money and how we use it. It's more than that. Their job was to take the master's wealth and then take the initiative to make it work for him. That's the responsibility. Use whatever God has given you and use it wisely. And I want you to see everybody got something. You know, every, everybody got something. I hope you noticed that. Uh, nobody was left with nothing to use for the master while he was away. <coughs> you have been given something, many somethings, if I were going to be accurate <laughs> or a little more precise, many somethings that you can use for God's kingdom. Uh, maybe you haven't thought about that. Uh, that means it's probably time that you did. You see, God doesn't treat you like a child. He doesn't treat his church like children. He gives us enormous responsibilities. We're not just saved from sin. We're saved to serve him. It's an enormous responsibility. Uh, the way we serve him, at least in part, is by serving other people. I want you to keep that in mind as we talk back through this parable. Uh, but notice in the parable that not everybody um, got uh, the same thing. Five, two, one. Five, you know, uh, one guy got five bags of gold, one guy got two, one guy got one. You know, My gifts are not as great as some of yours, and that's just a fact. I have to fight jealousy on that front, but it's true. My gifts are not as great as yours. Yours are not as great as somebody else's. There's there are people around you that have far greater gifts and that's okay in certain areas. I mean, it's supposed to be that way. God in his wisdom gave us what we were supposed to have. And, and he does it throughout history. He's done it in the church and he's done that in your life. He's given you what you're supposed to have. I don't, do you remember the story? I know you do. Most everybody will remember it at least. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Um, God calling Moses to deliver the, the Hebrews from slavery. Remember like... 1400 years or whatever before Christ and and uh, the Hebrew people slaves in Egypt about 400 years have been there forever. It was oppressive. It was cruel. It was degrading. It was brutal. And, and hearing their cries for deliverance, God appears to Moses in, in the bush. Remember? Remember this thing? It's, it's engulfed by flames but it's not consumed by flames. Now, that piqued your interest a little bit. Got Moses' interest and and God and Moses had this conversation. God says to him out of the bush, Yo, I want you to go to Egypt's ruler, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. And Moses responds, you probably remember. You remember, it seems like ours. You know, I alluded to it a couple of weeks ago um, uh, in passing, but his response was pretty much uh, just like our response is sometimes. I can't do that. I'm, I'm not the person for the job, you know, this excuse and that excuse, you know, I'm not a good talker, you know, people won't listen to me, uh, I get nervous in front of crowds, let somebody else do it, God, I'm, I'm a nobody, you remember that? And do you remember how God responded to Moses? This is so good. But God says this, Moses, what's in your hand? Moses looks at it and he says, well, it's a staff. You know, it's shepherd at the time and he's got a crook to hook the animals and he's got a staff to ward off the predators, right? And he said, it's a staff. Um, it, was, it wasn't a crown, it wasn't a scepter, you know, it, it wasn't a sword. It was just a simple stick. Moses, what's in your hand? From where I'm standing, Lord, doesn't look like much. I got this stick. But that simple stick became one of the greatest supernatural weapons in human history. God showed Moses that he could use ordinary things to do mighty things. And he says, Moses, take that staff, throw it on the ground. You got to go read this. Exodus, you know, start, well, hex, read the first couple, a few chapters. This is chapter four. You know, uh, throw it on the ground. And he did. What happened? became a snake. You know? uh, now, in this day of responsibility, the place for you to begin, the place for you to begin as a follower of Jesus is with this question that God asked Moses. What's in your hand? Well, what's God already given you? What, what is, what's in your hand? You might start with categories like objects and opportunities. 
Yeah, most everything can be boiled down to, uh, maybe not everything, but most everything kind of like that, uh, object and opportunities. Uh, it can be put in there somewhere, my car, my home, my time, my money, or maybe it's just the gospel itself. God called us, you, me, not preachers, all of us, to share the good news, the story about Jesus' death on the cross for our salvation with other people. All of us are supposed to be doing this. Objects and opportunities. You know, maybe, maybe it's relationships that you have. Maybe it's a friend or a neighbor. You know, maybe it's uh, somebody you, you like that's really far from God. Or maybe it's somebody you're just meeting. Maybe you're meeting them for a purpose. Maybe you have uh, uh, ability to teach or artistic talents or whatever it is. All of us have something. And most people have many things to use to accomplish our part in God's work here on earth as we serve one another. And in serving each other, we bring glory to God. This is the day of responsibility. What's in your hand? I mean, what is it? Well, what, what did you bring? What did God give you? What, and it matters. I mean, it really does matter. So take stock of what objects and opportunities you have. You need to pay attention because God's paying attention to them. Take stock of the objects and opportunities God has entrusted to you because the time of responsibility will end and the day of accountability will arrive. We can fulfill our responsibility now. But we can talk about it later on the day of accountability. In the, in the parable, the master has been gone a long time. I mean, he's, he's been gone a long time. He does return. And when he returns, what does he do? Well, he goes first to his servants. And he says, what would you do with what I gave you? What would you do? Because, listen, God will hold us accountable for how we have used what he has given. And that's not bad news. I mean, unless you're just going to obstinately refuse to use what you have for God. I mean, this is great news. He's not only, you know, drafting you onto the team. He wants to get you in the game. He wants you to have a part of it. He wants that whole business about, you know, laying up, storing treasures in heaven. He wants it to have some meaning, you know, something behind it. He, you know, so God's going to hold us accountable for how we use what we've been given, the finances, the opportunities we're given, the spouse that he gives us, the, the children, the church, the job, the neighbors that God has given us, the evangelistic opportunities that God sends our way, the opportunities to serve in the church he gives us, a social media platform if you're, you know, a wee bit of an influencer or something. He gives us homes. He gives us vehicles. You know, he, he gives us friends. All of these things or things that God has placed in our hands. What's in your hand? Well, what's in your hand? We're going to be accountable for it. And, and so God, God, you know, like this master, settles accounts. And, and never lose sight of the fact that that's coming. And you might say, that's not the God I believe in. Well, it doesn't matter. It won't, won't help you a little bit. Not a little bit. When, when the day comes and you say, well, I, I didn't really believe in that God. I'm going to opt out for that. There's not going to be any opting out. I mean, God's going to look at our lives and he's going to hold us accountable. He's going to settle accounts. We have to answer for the gifts that we've been given. Now, in the parable, two of the servants, beautiful job. They took risks. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. They took, they took risks. Uh, and that we don't, we're sort of risk averse in the church, you know. Uh, I, I can't teach. I've never taught before. You sat in 753,000 Sunday school classes and you can't teach. I hope I'm right behind you in line on Judgment Day because you're going to make me look good. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. But we gotta, we're going we're gonna to be held accountable, right? I mean, we are. It's, it's going to make us answer for this, you know. It's like uh, what, are, what, are we going, what, what have we done with what he's given? You know, two took risk. Risk paid off. Paid twice as much. Doubled their stuff. You know, the master said to them what? Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, share in your master's joy. Raise your hand if you want to hear that someday. I mean, I want to hear this. I know you do too. And, and we've got some folks in here that you should know about. I'm not going to call names because they would be embarrassed and then they would kick my behind after church. 
but who serve here hours every week in different corners of this church and on the property. People who just invest uh, in, in, with their abilities and gifts uh, in, in the work of the church you know, all over in, in so many ways. Um, and it's risky to do things like that, to love other people, to be involved. You get too close to people, they're complex, and they'll make me mad, and you know how that is. And, and, you know, he, he congratulates the two that do well, turns to the third, the guy with one bag, what'd you do with what I gave you? And the guy says, I did nothing. I did nothing. I showed up on Sundays, and I sat in the pew. I buried it. And it brings us to this. The greatest risk of all, it turns out, is not to risk anything. Just do nothing. You know, don't, work, you know, don't, uh, don't give uh, sacrificially to the cause of Christ. You know, don't risk uh, offending somebody by telling them about Jesus or inviting them to church. You know, don't risk, you know, uh, you know, embarrassment if you're not Billy Graham the first time you teach a Sunday school class or whatever. I mean, just don't do it. Just play it safe. Take it easy. You know, stay back. It's the most dangerous route of all. The greatest risk is not to risk anything because the master replies, you wicked, lazy, and worthless servant. <coughs> master throws him into outer darkness where there's weeping. Now, question, why is the master so angry? I mean, why? He got his money back. Why, why is he so ticked off? The master's anger is not about the loss of wealth. It's about the servant's wasted opportunity. What did you do with what I gave you? Nothing. He'd use it, he buried it. So afraid of, of a master that he saw as cruel and unforgiving, they didn't dare use what was trusted to him. I think maybe we're on the other side of the spectrum. I think we're so unimpressed with a God who would never send anybody out to weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth that we don't much give a flip if he said to do this or that. We think deep down we're probably in anyway. That, my friends, is self deception. I had a professor in. Uh, Bible college who said uh, there are none so deceived as the self-deceived. I think sometimes we deceive ourselves about what God is really like. Um, he didn't use it. He buried it. God didn't entrust uh, his wealth to us so that we could hide it or hoard it. He wants us to use it for him. And when King Jesus asks you that question, what did you do with what I gave you? I mean, how, how are you going to answer? I mean, this is worth thinking about. I mean, how, how are you going to answer? How are you serving God? Do you, do you have a ministry in the life of the church? And, and if you do have a ministry in the life of the church, at what level and what degree of attention do you give to it? I mean, is it in keeping with what God has given you or is it just a tiny little part of, you know, I don't know. It's something to think about. Because this question's coming. I mean, doing nothing is a dangerous way to live. It, not to care deeply. And that's what that is. Not to care deeply and profoundly enough about anything. To invest deeply. To give your heart away. And in the process, risk everything. Listen, the greatest risk of all, it turns out. Not to risk anything, play it safe, not caring, loving, not rejoicing, not living up to your full potential, not, you know, just playing it safe, you know, investing a little bit, you know, being cautious, prudent, dig a hole, bury it, be safe. It's often called the sin of omission, you know. It's a sin committed willingly. Um, it's by willingly not doing what you know is right to do. I don't know about y'all, but I'm saying ouch throughout this whole sermon. The, the third servant uh, didn't do anything wrong. He just didn't do anything. I bet he could point to all the things he didn't do. I don't drink beer. I don't go into, you know, 
bars and I don't, uh, you know, steal and I don't lie and I don't cheat on my wife. I don't do a lot of stuff. But it's not the question. It's, uh, what'd you do with what I gave you? This guy just didn't do anything. His sin was in failing to see the master correctly as someone that he could trust, someone that he could risk everything on, and he'd be okay. Uh, the issue here is not what you have, but what you do with what you have. The issue is not what you have, but what you... I don't have the gifts that some of you guys do, and I've noticed. <laughs> I wish I did. Uh, I, I don't, but it doesn't matter. It's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And Jesus tells us, be ready, be waiting, be watching, because he is coming. And our form of waiting, watching, is active, not passive. You know what I mean? Just sit back and... and you know, gaze at your navel until Jesus... No, it's, you know, it, he's saying the time is short. There's much to do. And once eternity begins, the matter is going to be very clear. The issue is not what you have. It's what you do with what you have. Uh, if you're truly born again, if you have confessed Jesus before others, and if you've been baptized into Christ... If you're, if you're trying to walk with him, right? I mean, you're really trying to walk with King Jesus if you're serving him, you know, however imperfectly you do it. And I assure you, we're all going to be very imperfect. And, and no matter how small you feel or how weak and insignificant you think you are, no matter how much you struggle with sin, no matter you grieve that your love for him and your service for him is weak, it doesn't quite measure up if you're truly clinging to Christ and laboring to give what he has given you, then not only are you holding something in your hand, he's holding you in his, and he always will. So I don't want this parable to shake your confidence, but I want to wake you up. And if your confidence needs to be shaken, I can live with that a little bit. We need a wake-up call. We need to recommit ourselves to service. See, Jesus didn't come all the way down here and, and shed his blood on the cross and suffer the wrath of God and taking all the sins of the world upon himself and being rejected and despised and humiliated so that the first time you step into the kingdom of God, you are met with a frown of disappointment on his face. It's not going to happen that way. He's going to see you and he's going to love you and he's breaking into a smile that will astonish you. And he's going to look you in the face and say, well done, good and faithful servant. The question, though, is, what are you doing with what he's given you? What are you doing with it? He's giving you this opportunity. Make an inventory. Make an inventory of what you have. But remember, the big issue is not just what you have. It's what you do with what you have. Father, we want to thank you so much for your love for us. You are faithful and good and true. You are kind beyond our words. But God, you are not to be mocked. You are to be obeyed. You are king and we are servants. Father, help us to be faithful servants. Help us to take what you have given us. Use it to the best of our abilities. Leave the results to you, but Father, help us to do what you've asked us to do. Share our belongings. Share our, our wealth. Share our witness. Uh, be loving and kind to people. Find a need in the church and fill it. And God, we know in all of that you will be glorified. And that's what we hope for. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.